And it doesn't matter if we don't have the answers to those questions, even before we leave this earth. Many, many things. And uh, so, there's so many questions for which the answer is, I don't know. But they're not related to living a godly life on this earth. Everything related to living a godly life, God has promised to give us an answer. So we can be sure of that. So when I try to answer questions also, I try to concentrate on the emphasis on life. And uh, questions related to knowledge, even if you don't get the answer, it doesn't matter. So whenever you think of, and not just mean, I don't mean just in a question answer session. When you try to understand scripture, don't become curious about things that are not going to help you live a godly life. It's unimportant. Be more curious about things that relate to a godly life, a godly home life, building a godly church and things like that. So, I want to show you one verse before I start. It's a very wonderful verse in Deuteronomy 29.29. Easy to remember. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children, to our sons forever, that we may obey everything God has revealed. So, there are many things which are secret. Secret in the sense that we don't know the full answer to them. It's not important that we know the answer. We leave it with God. But there are other things which are revealed. Those are the things we want to know the answer to. Okay. Here is a question which many may have. If I am dead to sin, like it says in Romans 6, 1 to 4, why do I still struggle against sin? What is this old man that is dead? Now the Bible speaks about the old man and the flesh. These are two different things. The flesh is not dead. The old man is dead. The flesh is what we are tempted by every day. You are testifying when you go into the waters of baptism, not that your flesh is dead, but that your old man is dead. Now most Christians don't know the difference between the two, because again, They don't read the Bible slowly and carefully. Okay, I want to use an illustration which will help you to understand it. A heart is like a home in which robbers, the robbers are the lusts in the flesh. Many, many lusts. And they come, want to come inside the home to rob us of the most valuable thing we have, which is purity. Or love. Or humility. They want to rob us of purity. Humility. And love. That's what they come for. All of these robbers. And they are called the lusts of the flesh. They come to our heart. And inside our heart. uh, In our unconverted days. We had a, a servant. Who was an unfaithful servant. It was called the old man. And that was our will to sin. And so whenever these robbers came and said, Listen, I'm going to give you a little pleasure with some sin. The old man says, Sure, come in. Take what you want. Take away my purity, but give me that little pleasure. And very often we have lost our purity for the sake of a little pleasure, sinful pleasure. In many ways. The old man has cooperated with the robbers. It's an unfaithful servant. Now, when I receive Christ as my Savior and Lord, that which happened on the cross 2,000 years ago takes place in my life. First of all, all my sins are forgiven. That forgiveness took place 2,000 years ago. But it becomes real in my life only when I repent and ask Jesus to come into my heart and forgive me. 
In the same way, my old man, this unfaithful servant, in Christ was crucified, but it becomes real in me only when I accept Christ. And so when I receive Christ, really as Lord of my life, this unfaithful servant is slain. In baptism, I am burying that unfaithful servant. And in, God doesn't leave the heart empty. He puts a new servant there called the new man. The new man is very faithful. He doesn't want to open the door. But are the robbers still active? Oh yeah, the rape robbers are hale and hearty. In fact, they are more eager now to come inside the heart. Now that they have known that this unfaithful servant is gone, they keep banging at the door of our heart even stronger. That's why you find when you become a Christian, temptation can sometimes become stronger. Jesus was baptized and the next thing we read is he was tempted by the devil. So the robbers, the lusts of the flesh, they are hale and hearty, they will never die till Jesus comes. They keep on tempting us and now we have this new man inside who is this faithful servant. Then we say, how does a believer fall into sin? How do these robbers still come in? How do these robbers come and steal a believer's purity and humility and love? Because this new man, he probably doesn't eat enough, he doesn't exercise enough, and so he's not strong enough to keep the door shut. He wants to. He's not like the old man who was wanting to open the door. This guy doesn't open the door, but he's not strong enough to keep it shut. Because he's not feeding on the word of God. He's not living a life filled with the Holy Spirit. He's not seeking God for grace, then of course he's weak. And the robbers just come push in and come right in. And that's when we lose our temper or we lust or watch internet pornography or all types of things can happen to a believer. The difference is that the believer doesn't want to do it. The unbeliever wants to do it. That's why when a believer has fallen into sin, he immediately feels so bad. Oh Lord, I'm sorry. The unbeliever doesn't. He doesn't feel bad at all. So that's why we still have to struggle against sin, even though the old man is dead, because we got to keep this new man, which is the mind which does not want to sin. I believe if you are really born again, you have a mind that doesn't want to sin. When keep people come to me for baptism, I ask them only one question. I mean, I ask them this question. Do you want to sin? I'm not asking you whether you will sin. We may all fall, but do you want to sin? And if you are really born again, the answer will be no, I never want to sin. Ask them, do you want to sin even once in your life? The answer is no. And I believe most of you can say that. So the solution is to keep our new man, this mind that now wants to do God's will, fed and strengthened. And there are many ways we can do it. By reading God's word, by listening to messages, by seeking fellowship with godly people, reading godly literature that will lead us to the scriptures. And avoiding uh, literature and pictures and all that will tempt us unnecessarily. You know, and if you find it a struggle to avoid that, ask God for grace. Lord, I find a pull to that type of thing. Please keep me away from it. Or run away from, the Bible says, run away from temptation. And when you find yourself, particularly when we are lonely, most of the time when we are alone, we get tempted. We, we need to quickly seek for some fellowship, even if it's over the telephone. I mean, it's good to have some brother or somebody whom you can feel you can, or sister, uh, if you're a lady, whom you can call up and say, listen, I'm being tempted now, please pray for me, or something like that. So that's the answer to that one. Okay, another question is, Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 17, that he did not come to abolish uh, the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. But yet it says in Hebrews 8.13 that the old covenant, the first covenant is obsolete and ready to disappear. So what is the difference between one place Jesus saying in Matthew 5.17 that he's not come to abolish it 
in another place it says it's already obsolete. Now we need to understand the way the word law is used. In Matthew 5.17, Jesus uses an expression called the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets is the way they describe what we today call the Old Testament of the Bible. I want you to know that the word Old Testament is never found in the Bible. It's a phrase that man has used to describe the first 39 books. But it's not found in the Bible itself. The Old Testament is, I mean it's a helpful phrase to describe the first 39 books. But it's not found in the Bible itself. And so we can get a bit confused because testament, covenant, agreement all mean the same thing. So on one hand we say, I know people have asked me, Brother Zach, you say the old covenant is abolished. Does it mean we don't read the Old Testament anymore? Because testament and covenant mean the same thing. Then I have to explain to them, listen, the word Old Testament is never found in the Bible. It's not New Testament. That's not the name for the 27 books. No, that's just man's way of describing it. The the way Jesus called it was the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets means the five books of Moses were called the law and the other books were called the prophets. The law and the prophets. So that has not been abolished. Definitely not. We've still got it in our book. I read it regularly. The law and the prophets. So Jesus did not come to cancel out the Old Testament and say throw those 39 books away. So that's what he was saying in Matthew 5.17. I haven't come to abolish the Old Testament books of the Bible. No. I've come to fulfill them. And he fulfilled all the prophecies in those 39 books. That's what he's saying there. But what he's saying in Hebrews 8.13 is the old covenant. An agreement that God made with the people of Israel. And I don't happen to belong to the people of Israel. I'm part of the church. God made an agreement through Moses with the people of Israel saying, You fulfill these conditions and I'll do all this for you. And it was all earthly blessings mostly. And he fulfilled it. God told them that uh, I will give you this land, the land of Canaan. And even today, Israel is living in that land today because God promised it to Abraham many years ago. So that's, it's all earthly. But that covenant has been, is obsolete. It's cancelled. There is no relationship of God now with Israel in that way. Today the Bible says there is no Jew or Gentile. Now I know there are some Christians who try to say that God still has a special uh, place for them. You can't find it in the New Testament. There are, I mean, there were physical blessings that he promised Abraham's seed and he's given it to them. Physical blessing. Spiritually, there's nothing promised to the children of Abraham anywhere in the Bible. To the spiritual children of Abraham, that's us, God's promised Abraham's blessing. So it's the old covenant, the old agreement the old way of God dealing with man, which sometimes Christians can take up and live by. For example, external rules. You know, there are a lot of churches that make a lot of external rules. That's, that's the, though it's not the law of Moses, it's the spirit of the law of Moses. And that never, it never made people holy in Israel, and it doesn't make people holy in such churches today. It just makes them look holy just like people in Israel looked holy compared to the Assyrians and the Egyptians and the Midianites and all that. But they were not really inwardly. If you had looked into the heart of an Israelite, like the heart of Samson. The heart of Samson was as adulterous as the heart of the Philistines. And there was no change inside. So, it was only on the external. And a church that emphasizes the externals may look nice and prim and proper on the outside. You can't change the heart that way. So that old way of God dealing with man, which is symbolized by one word, law, has been abolished. Not the Old Testament. So that is the difference. And that's important for us to know because if you live according to that, I can give it to you in writing, you'll never be a holy in a hundred years. You'll get a reputation. And you will be the first person to know that you don't deserve that reputation because you know your heart is corrupt. Everybody thinks you're holy because you're dressed so modestly and you uh, behave properly and you read the Bible and you go to church. But you know your heart is filthy. And uh, that, the new covenant never made anybody's heart pure and the old covenant rather. 
is the new covenant where God says, I will give you a new heart, I'll put my Holy Spirit within you. That's how we become holy. Okay, the next question is, how do I know whether I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and how can I be sure? There are two gifts that the Apostle Paul offered to people on the day of Pentecost, the first time the gospel was preached. And those two gifts were, Acts 2.48, the forgiveness of your sins, the last part of verse 38, Acts 2.38, the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift, the gift means you don't pay for it. If you have to work and pray and fast and all, it's not a gift. A gift is something you receive. Of course, if you don't stretch out your hand, you don't receive it. And in the New Testament, stretching out the hand is called faith. Let me give you an illustration of by grace through faith. By grace means God from heaven is stretching out every blessing of the Holy Spirit to you. Forgiveness of sins. Here it is. The power of the Holy Spirit. Here it is. That's by grace. Faith is my hand reaching up saying thank you Lord. Now if I don't say thank you Lord and take it, I don't get it. Even though God is reaching out with Ephesians 1.3 says every blessing of the Holy Spirit is mine already in Christ. It's purchased. You don't go and claim it. It's like, <clears throat> you know, if uh, somebody has gone to a store and bought a whole lot of things for you and says, listen, just go and pick it up. It's all paid for. You don't pick it up, it's there. Paid for, it's for yours. You got the receipt, the guy sent you the receipt out of love for you. Maybe it's a marriage gift, a whole lot of things, everything you need for your home. And it's there and you don't go and pick it up. Or maybe you're very timid and you go and take just one little pillow from there or something and take it home. When he's bought a whole lot of things for you. And that's how a lot of Christians are. They are very timid. Oh, can I take that? Can I take that? I want to tell you, Ephesians 1, 3, every single blessing of the Holy Spirit is yours. If I've got more than you, it's not because I'm better than you. I just believed the receipt and went and took it all from the shop. I don't believe I've taken it all. I've still got a lot more to take. But I plan to take it all before I leave this earth. And I want to encourage you to take, go, go to the store, go to heaven and say, Lord, it's mine, Ephesians 1, 3. It's mine. What is there which is not mine? You and I are equal. Christ died for you as much as for me. So, <clears throat> that's the first thing I want you to remember. And the other thing is, <clears throat> if you went to the early apostles, when they were waiting in the upper room in Jerusalem, you know, they waited there for ten days. But at that time, they didn't know how long they had to wait. And remember this, there's no such thing as having to wait for the Holy Spirit now. The only people in the Acts of the Apostles who waited for the Holy Spirit was the first group. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out from heaven to this earth. After the day of Pentecost, there's no point waiting for the Holy Spirit because He's already here. You don't have to wait for somebody who's already at your door. You wait. In those days, He hadn't come to the door. And the, Jesus said, you wait, he, I will send Him. And there was a particular plan of God. And they didn't know how long they had to wait. They waited, 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 and he came. Now he's come. You never find after that anybody being asked to wait for the Holy Spirit. Now I know there are many Pentecostal charismatic churches where they have meetings called tarrying meetings. Tarrying is the old King James Version language for what Jesus told them. Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. I want to tell you there's no need to wait. If there is a waiting, it's on your side. I mean, to use an illustration, if, uh, if I have a little son and he comes to me and s with a, a glass full of mud and says, Dad, I want some milk. I say, sure. Empty that glass out first. But there's a lot of muck in it. And he goes back, comes back after an hour and says, Dad, I want some milk. I say, listen, empty that cup out. And he comes back after one hour. He's waiting. But what's he waiting for? He's not waiting for me to give him the milk. I've got it all ready. But he's not ready to chuck that all out. All that trash that he's got in his glass. Throw it out. Empty it. Come to me with an empty glass and I'll fill you. So that's, if there's a tarrying today, it's because we haven't emptied our heart 
and surrendered everything to Christ. That's the only reason. There's no tarrying from God's side. God's ready. The moment you say, Lord, I'm empty to myself, everything, all that I have is yours. He fills us immediately. There's no waiting for anything. So, that's the other thing I want to say. But if you were to go to those early apostles while they were waiting and ask them, what are you waiting for? They said, Jesus told us to wait, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Great. Then you ask them, how do you know that you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit? They would have said, they would not have said, we will get some electric shock or we will speak in tongues because they had never heard anybody's testimony. We look for those things because we have heard 101 testimonies. That's our problem. If you go to the Bible, they would have only given you one answer in those days. Jesus told us when he went up to heaven that we would receive power. He said we will have power to be witnesses for Christ. And right now we sense we don't have that power to be by our life and by our words to be a witness for Christ. I don't have that power. We're waiting for that. When we get, when we get it we'll know. None of them would have said about tongues or healing or miracles or any other thing. They would have only talked about power. Because that's the only thing Jesus said. So I believe that is the mark of being filled with the Holy Spirit. That we get power to be a witness for Christ by our life and by our words. The gifts of the Spirit are different. God may give different gifts to different people. But that is how we know. So... We can still ask the question, well, how do I know I got that power or not? I go back to the first gift. Remember, I told you there are two gifts. One is forgiveness of sins. The other is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Now, many of you, or most of you, have received the forgiveness of sins. I ask you, how do you know that you got forgiveness of sins? Supposing an unbeliever were to come to you and say, ask you this question. Are you sure your sins are forgiven? You say, yes, I'm sure. And you say... And he says, listen, how can I be sure that my sins are forgiven? What answer would you give? You would say, well, first of all, it says in God's word that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. 1 John 1, 9. And there's a witness of the Holy Spirit in our heart. If you're really forgiven and you're really a child of God, the Holy Spirit bears a little witness in your heart saying, hey, you're a child of God. Your sins are forgiven. So it's the double witness of the written word of God and the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. That's how we know our sins are forgiven. It's exactly the same with being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the second gift. First gift is forgiveness of sins. Second gift is gift of the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, do I read in the word of God? Luke eleven thirteen. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father... Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. Lord, I'm sure my earthly father would not deny me bread if I wanted it. And I believe that I come to you, you will give me the Holy Spirit more than any earthly father or mother would give milk or bread to its hungry child. I come to you with faith. Uh, I want you to give me an assurance in my heart. I remember in my own life I didn't have assurance of the forgiveness of sins for a number of years. One day I got it. Never doubted it after that. And I urge people always, you must be sure. Ask God to give you an assurance that you are His child. Your sins are forgiven. In the same way, ask God to give you an assurance that He's really given you His Spirit and filled you with the Holy Spirit. And then, keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. And basically, I would say, to remain being filled with the Holy Spirit, I found personally in my life there are only two Conditions required. One is keep a good conscience. Always keep a good conscience. Uh, as soon as you're aware of sin, confess it. If you've hurt somebody, confess to that person. If it's a sin against God, confess it to God. And secondly, humble yourself. That's all that's required. If you remain with a good conscience and you seek to go down the way of humility, I can assure you 
you will always be filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to have any feeling. In the time of need, you'll find boldness coming up in you to be a witness for Christ. You'll find words that God's Holy Spirit gives you to answer people who ask you about your faith. So, but we must value. You know, if you don't value anything, God doesn't give it to you. Value being filled with the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, I want at any cost to be filled with the Holy Spirit all the time. Be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't worry about dates. Don't worry about experiences. And if there is a gift of the Holy Spirit that you should seek, it is not tongues. Even though that is what most Pentecostals and Charismatics will say to you. It's a good gift. Tongues, but that's not the main thing you should seek. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 14. I want to base what I say on scripture. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 5. He says here, Yeah, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. Which proves that they all did not. I mean, if everybody did, there's no point saying, I wish you all spoke in tongues. But that's only a desire of Paul. You know, earlier on in chapter 7, Paul says, I wish all of you were single. You know that? How many of you take that seriously? (laughs) It's the same Paul who says, I wish you all spoke in tongues. But I've never heard anybody majoring on, I wish you all were single. They all major on this verse, I wish you all spoke in tongues. But it's just seven chapters earlier in the same letter, Paul says that. So that is, he's just expressing a desire. I wish you were all single because I find there's a greater opportunity to travel around and preach the gospel. But he says, I realize that God calls people to be married and I think among believers, 99% of believers are called to be married. In the same way, the same apostle says later on, I wish you all speak in tongues. I find it to be a good gift. But that's not the main gift, he says. Verse 5, even more, I wish you would prophesy. Now prophesy is such a spiritual word that as soon as you hear it and say, oh no, that's not for me. I'm just an ordinary believer. It's ordinary believers who are supposed to prophesy. Because you have misunderstood prophecy. Prophecy, many people think, is, you know, getting up, closing your eyes and with a squeaky voice saying something about the future. That's not prophecy. That is a Pentecostal perversion of it. Prophecy is to speak to people to encourage them. Verse 3, to challenge them, to comfort them, console them, and to build them up. Isn't that a very good gift to have? And I don't mean when standing in a pulpit. Think of a sister who is a mother of a number of children. Never stands in her pulpit in her whole life. Can she prophesy? Sure. There may be other sisters who come to her house. And they are in need. Or who call her on the telephone. Can you prophesy over the telephone? Why not? Can you encourage somebody over the telephone? That's prophecy. Can you challenge somebody to a godly life over the telephone in two minutes? Yeah, that's prophecy. Can you build up somebody? There are so many ways of prophesying today. And not all from the pulpit. I've been so encouraged in talking to people in ordinary conversation. And they didn't realize they were prophesying to me. They were. They were encouraging me and building me up. And the Bible says in Acts 2.17 that God will pour out His Spirit and all my sons and daughters will prophesy. Acts 2.17 Claim it. Say, Lord, I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter. I'm your daughter. You said you'd pour out upon your spirit upon me that I would have the gift of prophecy. But there is a requirement. It says here, earnestly desire to prophesy. 14.39 1 Corinthians 14.39 and 1 Corinthians 14.1 Two verses. It's at the beginning and end of chapter 14 earnestly desire not just a sort of a weak desire yeah that'll be good if I can prophesy not like that Lord I want to prophesy how many of you will go to God today and say to him in prayer by yourself alone with him Lord I want to prophesy I'm a son of God I'm a daughter of God I want to prophesy I want to speak no, I, I may never stand in a pulpit in all my life. But when I speak two sentences to some person whom I meet anywhere, maybe in a store, 
It may be at home. It may be on the phone. I want to prophesy. I want to share something that will really bless them. Really encourage them. Really lift up their spirits and build them up spiritually. Imagine if everybody in this church began to do that. I tell you, what a wonderful church this will be. You, never, you may never stand in the pulpit in all your life. And you have, all your prophecies may never be more than one minute long. I mean, this morning we looked at Melchizedek's prophecy, prophecy which took about 20 seconds. 20 seconds? Such a mighty prophecy that helped Abraham. It doesn't have to be long. It can be a word that God... You know, sometimes you feel a burden in your heart for something. And uh, it's really blessed you something, that thought came to your mind from God's word. And a little later during the day, somebody comes along. Maybe you're a young sister or an older sister with children. And this other sister comes to your house. Why don't you share it? Why don't you share what God gave you? Why you want to, like a miser, hoard that precious treasure God gave you in his word? Give it out. Water that other person. And you'll find God waters you. I believe many, many Christians have been blessed by God's word that has blessed them, but like misers, they store it up. They don't give it out to others. I remember one brother in my church once came to me and asked me, Brother Zach, I just can't remember scripture. Um, No matter how much I try, how do you remember scripture so much? I said, I'll tell you. I don't believe I've got a better memory than yours. I'll tell you what I've done for many, many years, more than 45 years. When I get a scripture that blesses me, I try my best to share it with as many people as possible. Not in a big sermon. I may be sitting talking to somebody who came to see me in my home. And I say, brother, you know I read a verse this morning. I got something out of it. This is what I got. And maybe later on in the day or the next day I meet somebody else and I say, you know I got a way worse yesterday. It really blessed me. And I've shared that with three, four people. I watered others with that scripture God gave me. You know what God does? He waters me and that word sticks in my mind. Now if I had not shared it with others and had like a miser hoarded it for myself, I would have forgotten it and lost it. I've seen that. I've seen it where I've received something from a verse of scripture and never thought of sharing it with others and later on I say, boy, what was that scripture? I remember something God said to me. God will bless you if you pass on to others what he blesses you with. And that could be a prophecy. It may, you never know how it will bless. You know, in many of our small churches, I have encouraged the people even to get, let their children get up. I say, get your children, eight, nine years old, tell them to stand up and share something they read from the Bible that spoke to their heart. Maybe just a verse. They open the Bible, read a verse and sit down. It's the first step. I say, it's easy to do it in a small church. You can't do it in a big church, but you can do that. And I believe that you must, parents, you must encourage your children to read the Bible, even if it's three, four verses a day, to read the Bible every day and ask them once in a while, is there something that Jesus spoke to your heart today of scripture? What was that? Encourage them to share God's word from early. Then they won't grow up and become like the 20, 30, 40 year olds who are shy to share anything at all. Train them when they are small. Okay. Another question. Uh, What does Paul mean when he says, I became all things to all people to win them? How do we see Christ ministering to many lost youth today? Do we dress in chains and piercings and talk like them, doing what they do? How do I relate? Many churches believe they should be brought, others should be brought into the church and made comfortable so that they can hear the gospel preached. What do you think? Well, uh, there were people in Jesus' time also wearing tattoos and I can't imagine Jesus wearing tattoos in order to attract them. Uh, See, Jesus was the friend of sinners, but he didn't become a sinner in order to win them. He was a friend of sinners. But he didn't do what they did. He didn't commit adultery to become friends with uh, adulterous people. He loved them and he helped them. He didn't cheat on the taxes to be friends with the tax collectors. You don't have to do what they do. You can be friendly with them. And I can't imagine Jesus 
using the techniques of the world to attract people. First of all, Jesus was not here to attract people with any of these techniques. I've often said in our own church, I said, I don't want anybody to be attracted to our church by the music we have. I don't want anybody to be attracted to our church because of the size of our building or the good looking people who sit there or any such thing. I want to be attracted, I want people to be attracted to the church because of the message of holiness that we preach and fellowship with God. That you can come into a right relationship with God. That is what we want to use to draw people to the church. Now, if on the other hand we say, boy, if we have some lot of music and grand music, some of the young people will be attracted, they'd be attracted for the wrong reasons. You know, we've had different people come to our churches at different times, you know, testing us out, see, is this the church we should be a part of? I'll never forget one Sunday. Uh, it, I mean, our music is not all that great. But one day it was particularly bad. Even I felt it was bad. <laughs> and I, I was wondering, hey, what happened today, man? <laughs> today doesn't seem to be the way it usually is. And after the meeting was over, after the service was over, I mean, you call it service, we call it meeting. Um, meeting was over, I was meeting, um, seeking people, and I met a young couple who had come to the church, very musically minded, I knew them. Uh, both musically minded people who had come to test out our church. And they heard the music that day, never came again. I said, Lord, now I know why <laughs> the music was bad today, because you wanted to drive away certain people who were coming for the wrong reasons. No, we don't want people to be drawn to the church for the music. We don't want people to be drawn for any other reason that they want to come into fellowship with Almighty God. They want to surrender to Jesus Christ and live a holy life. And I believe that the Lord will add to us, I mean I can testify this for 34 years now, we have never preached uh, what they call a seeker friendly message. We preach the truth of God, the message of discipleship, with a take it or leave it. We love you, but we're not going to lower the standards to get you in. Do you know that Noah preached a strong message? And the result is that when he started his church, there were eight people. After 120 years, you know how many there were in his church? Eight people. And that was all his family. That's all. You know why? Supposing Noah had lowered... I've often thought about this. Supposing Noah had lowered the standards. Uh... Okay, brother, you're a bit of an adulterous guy, right? Never mind, come along. We can have people like that also in our church, okay. And somebody else who's got some other sinful habit which he doesn't want to give up. Come along, come along, it's okay. We, we're not that particular. We're all sinners. You know what would have happened? This church would have grown from 8 to 80 to 800. And they would have all got drowned in the flood. That's the thing. And none of us would be alive today. <laughs> Do you know... <laughs> Do you know that we are all descendants of Noah, by the way? Not just descendants of Adam. Did you know that? And do you know that all of us are alive today because one man called Noah was faithful in his time? Otherwise God would have wiped out the whole world. He was going to wipe out the whole world, but he found one man, Noah, and he said, okay, I'll save that one man. That's why when I go to heaven, one of the first people I want to meet is Noah. I say, brother, thank you for <laughs> being faithful. You, you gave me a chance to come to heaven. Otherwise I wouldn't even have been born. This is true. So you see there the faithfulness. He's one of my great heroes from the Old Testament. A man who never compromised his message. He's called in the New Testament a preacher of righteousness. He condemned the world, it says, by his preaching. He was a preacher of righteousness. And I say, Lord, Jesus said in the last days it will be like the days of Noah. There's going to be sin, sex, violence all around. But also there will be a few people like Noah. And I want to be one of them. You can be one of them. And there will be a few people like Mrs. Noah, who supported her husband. And you sisters can be like that. So, a man who was very careful to bring up his family in godly ways. Who lived an upright life. Whose children saw dad getting up early in the morning, chopping trees down to build a ship. And those children saw, hey, dad really believes what he's preaching. He's not just preaching. He really, uh, that's, he lives it. He's preaching it and he's spending his own money 
to build a ship. They said, this must be real. You know, when children see parents living at home, what they preach, they'll all be saved. Every one of them. It's when we don't live at home what we preach that we lose our children. You don't have to be great preachers to save your children, but you've got to live at home what you speak. And I don't mean perfect. I mean honest. I never wanted my children to think I'm a perfect father because I'm not. But I wanted them to know I'm an honest father. That's when I did something wrong. I'd say, I'm sorry, that was my mistake. I slipped up there. I tell you, your children don't expect perfection from you, but they expect honesty. None of us are perfect. But if they see you're honest, oh, I'm sorry, that was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have spoken like that. That was wrong what we did. Let's ask the Lord to forgive us. So, I, I believe that that's how Noah was. He wasn't a perfect man. Nobody was, he was in the old covenant. So, <clears throat> um, that's how we uh, take a stand and we don't come down to the level of the young people around us the way they dress and all that. No. I want to dress in a dignified way. And you know, Jesus became like the rest of uh, humanity, normal people, not the people who were trying to be radical in the way they dressed. How does, another question, how does revelation come? How can I get a re- greater revelation of Jesus and what he's done for me? Revelation is a New Testament word. It's different from knowledge. Revelation is what God reveals. It's more than understanding. Let me read you a verse in Matthew 11, verse 25. It says, Jesus said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and revealed them to babes. So, he uses that word reveal, revelation. So, to whom does God reveal the great mysteries and truths of scripture? He hides it deliberately from the clever and the intelligent. So, if some of you say, well, boy, I'm not so clever, I'm not so intelligent. You're lucky, brother. Sister, you're really lucky. I mean, you may not be able to do math and science and all so well, but when it comes to scripture, you're, go, you're, gotta, you're much better than us. Some of us got, got the big handicap called intelligence. He hides it from the wise and the intelligent. And he reveals it to babes. Now, unfortunately, I happen to be one of those intelligent people. And I said, well, what shall I do, Lord? I, I didn't want to be intelligent. I was just born that way. What can I do? How will I know the scriptures? What can I do if you made me intelligent? And the Lord said, okay, you've got to overcome that pride in it. It's not the intelligence that hinders us from knowing scripture. Intelligent people are usually proud. And it's that pride in their intelligence that prevents them from knowing scripture. Like rich people. Why did Jesus say it's difficult for a rich person to enter God's kingdom? What, what do you mean by rich? According to standards of Indian villages, everybody in America is rich. Anybody who's got a car is rich. By Indian standards. So what do you do? Who's rich? It's not the amount of wealth you have, but rich people tend to be proud of their wealth. And wherever there's pride, for example, a very handsome, good-looking person or a pretty woman is very proud of her good looks. You know, from childhood, they've been used to people admiring, oh, you're such a pretty girl, you're a pretty girl, and they grow up pretty proud of that, and that pride hinders them from getting God's grace and from growing up. It's not the wealth or the beauty or the intelligence that hinders them from receiving God's grace. It is the pride in their beauty, the pride in their intelligence, and the pride in their wealth. Now, it's possible that an intelligent person can be humble. It's possible that a very pretty, good-looking person can be very humble. And it's possible that a very rich person can be very humble. Then they get God's grace. So, when Jesus said, you must be like babes, you remember when Jesus took a little child and said, be humble like this little child. So it's humility that he was emphasizing. So to, un- to get God's revelation, we must, become, we must come to God in humility and say, Lord, my intelligence is okay for the things of the world. But when it comes to scripture, I don't know a thing. That's, I'll tell you honestly, that's how I come to scripture. 
I say, Lord, I can use my clever mind for all these other things in the world. But if I want to know scripture, it just doesn't help. I want to come to the scripture as if I'm stupid. I'm as stupid as a donkey trying to understand scripture. I'm a babe. I don't know. I'm ignorant. I'm foolish. Teach me, Lord. And he shows me the most amazing things in scripture. So it's humility by which we get revelation. Let me show you a verse in Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 1, Paul says in verse 17, My prayer is that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. Lord, I want revelation. God alone can give it. You know, Paul doesn't tell the Ephesians, read this letter I'm writing to you ten times and you'll understand it. No, you won't understand it. You can read it ten times or a hundred times. God has to give you revelation, dear brothers in Ephesus, sisters. Ask God to give you rev- the spirit of revelation. It's different from knowledge. Think of Paul's closest co-worker, Timothy. Look what he says to Timothy in Second Timothy and chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter... Now, Timothy was Paul's closest co-worker. There are 101 things that Paul shared with Timothy. But see what he says to him. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7. Timothy, think about what I say. And the Lord will give you understanding about in everything. I'm sorry, I can't give it to you. You're my closest co-worker, but I'm sorry, I can't give you an understanding on these things. I cannot communicate it to you. I cannot communicate divine revelation to my wife or my children or to anybody. I can say, please think about what I say. And the Lord will give you understanding. And I've seen this through the years. I preach the same message in so many places in the world. And I find some people get revelation. And many people don't. Why is that? They're listening to the same message. They're listening to my CDs all over. How is it some people get revelation? It changes their life. And some people, they just get information. It doesn't change their life. How do you know the difference between knowledge and revelation? What's the difference? Revelation will change your life. It will change your value system. Knowledge will just fill your head with information which you can then think you can preach to others. It won't change your value system. It won't change the way you live. And if when you hear somebody preach and it doesn't change the way you live, it doesn't change your, what you value in this world as get the right sense of heavenly values, then it's only information. It may be correct information. Like if I got up here and said 2 plus 2 is 4, 3 plus 3 is 6, 4 plus 4 is 8, and you say, yeah, I got it. What do you get? Information. It doesn't change your life. So, revelation, you need humility, and um, you got to seek God for His Holy Spirit to reveal to you. Okay, another question is concerning marriage. What should a husband and wife do? What should a wife do if her husband doesn't take spiritual leadership in the home? Like reading God's word to the family, praying together, praying with the wife, etc. See, it's like this. Generally speaking, God has called the man to be the worker outside the home, to earn the living, and the woman to be the homemaker. We understand that. That's generally God's will. But supposing a man becomes an invalid, Paralyzed, sick, and lying in bed, can't, can't go to work. Not because he doesn't want to, because he's paralyzed. The woman has to go to work then. She's got to do something to earn her living. Or in some cases in India where what the man earns is not enough for the family. Then the woman has to go to work. So, where a man cannot do or does not do, what he's supposed to do, then the woman has to do it. So it's like that. The man is supposed to be the leader in the house spiritually, but he may be a believer, but he doesn't take his calling seriously. Then the woman has to do it. She has to say, okay, let's pray. Let's read the word. And um, if her husband comes along, well and good. If she doesn't, she just teaches the children herself. And one of the great examples in the Bible is Timothy's mother. 
Timothy's mother, we read in 2 Timothy 1, verse 5, Paul says, I am mindful of the sincere faith which was first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunike. That's the way they pronounce it in the Greek, Eunike. Um, so his mother's name was Eunike. And um, his father, we read in Acts 16, was a Greek. Now there was a law among the Jews that you shouldn't marry non-Jews. And if the grandmother was a God-fearing person, how did this daughter Eunike go and marry a non-Jewish Greek for businessman or whatever it is? Maybe she was backslidden. And she got married to this Greek businessman who was only interested in money. And then Timothy was born. And she got converted. She came back to the faith of her mother. And her father, her husband, didn't have much interest in spiritual things. And Paul says to Timothy, it was, you got your faith from your mother. Not from your father. He didn't have any faith. But what a job that Timothy's mother, Eunike, did. That with her father, with her husband taking no interest, she worked with this little boy that by the time he was 18 or 19 years old, he was such a wholehearted disciple of Jesus that the Apostle Paul selected him to be on his team. Boy, I take my hats off to that lady Eunike. Single handedly, she raised an apostle. Many of you have heard of the great man of God, John Wesley, in England. They say John Wesley was the one who saved England from a revolution. He was the man who saved so many people from alcoholism, prostitution, and brought so many people to a holy life. His brother, Charles Wesley, wrote about 6,000 hymns, many of them we sing. Do you know their father never took much interest? Their father was a preacher, but never took much interest in his children. They had a godly mother, Susanna Wesley. And she had about 18 children, about, I think seven or eight of them died. But um, she had at least about nine or ten living children. And she would spend one hour every week with each child individually. A week, not every day. One hour a week with each of her nine children. Taught them God's word taught them good manners, taught them so many things. Just this mother with eight, nine children. The father was not at all interested in bringing up the children and she did such a fantastic job that John Wesley became the man he became. And when John Wesley was not a married man in the early days and he wanted to teach all the early, he founded the Methodist church and he wanted to teach the Methodist families how to bring up their families. He called his mother and said, Mom, tell us how to bring up a good family. And she gave advice. So here are some amazing examples like this of women, Timothy's mother, John Wesley's mother, who did a fantastic job single-handedly with no help from their husbands. So, uh, keep those examples before you and pray that God will, through that, make your husband also more responsible. Okay, another question is also concerning my husband and I have got grown up children who are not Christians. What is the most important thing we can do for them to help them find salvation and what is the most important thing not to do? Well, the most important thing not to do is to keep nagging them and saying, why aren't you saved? And if you make Every time you meet them, you preach at them, you'll drive them away. I think the most important thing to do for them is to pray for them and love them. Pray for them in secret every single day. I always tell people whose children are gone away from home and unconverted, I say, listen, will you promise me one thing? That every single day, if you're, uh, if you're only one person, you pray yourself, if both husband and wife are alive, pray together for Every child of yours by name. My wife and I have done that regularly. Lord, we pray for this one, and this one, and this one. Uh, we start praying for our grandchildren now, by name. Pray, pray for them. I tell you, Almighty God can do everything. 
He's sovereign. I'm not a Calvinist. But when I kneel down and pray, I am. I believe that Almighty God can do everything. <laughs> that His grace is irresistible. <laughs> that <laughs> God can do everything. <laughs> when I preach, I'm a thorough Armenian. But <clears throat> I say, Lord, you can do everything. You can save that person's soul. You can bring that person to Christ. You can arrange circumstances in that person's life. Make life difficult for that person. Or do something. Break his legs. Get him into a car accident. Something. But bring him to Christ. Are you willing to pray such desperate prayers? I am. If I ever hear that any one of my children were going astray, I'd even pray they'd have a car accident. Lord, don't take away their life. They've got to be saved. But do anything you like. Break their bones. Do give them whatever you like. Save their soul. You know, we're not so desperate. We think somehow or the other they'll make it to heaven. They will not. They will burn in hell for eternity. And if you believe that, you'd pray desperate prayers for them. Lord, do anything. Bring them to a place of need in their life. That's the way to pray for an unconverted husband or an unconverted wife or an unconverted son or daughter or son-in-law or daughter-in-law. Pray for them that they will get come to a place of need in their life and turn to God. And if you keep praying that, I tell you, I believe with all my heart that Almighty God will answer that prayer. Because there's nothing He cannot do. He is almighty. He can arrange circumstances. He will not force a person's will. I, when I said I'm a Calvinist and I pray, I'm not a Calvinist at any time. But I believe, it's only a joke. What I mean is I believe in the sovereignty of God. That's what I mean. I believe God's almighty. He doesn't force anybody to accept Him. He doesn't elect somebody from eternity to be His or not. If that's the case, I wouldn't pray for anybody. But uh, I believe that God is sovereign. He can arrange circumstances such that people can come to a place of need because I pray. It's true that when I pray, something happens. You mustn't think that, well, whether I pray or not, uh, God's will will be done. Then you're a Calvinist. No, that's not how we... We believe that when we pray, something happens. God's going to change something when I pray. God's going to do something to that person, which will not happen if I don't pray. And think what a lot we have missed in our life, but not praying. And how long does it pray, take to pray? I sometimes tell people, when I tell the people, you know, uh, Brother Zach, what can we do for you? I say, pray for me. That's all I want. I don't need your money, I don't need anything else, but pray for me. If my, my, if my name comes into your mind anytime, anywhere, I say, take 15 seconds. How much? 15 seconds to pray that God will give me an anointing to serve him and give me help. To travel. That's all I ask for. How long does it take to pray for someone? 15 seconds. And I believe that there will be a result from that. And I tell you, you'll see, you do that and you'll see a fruit in eternity from my labors. For which you'll get a reward too. Why not pray for your children like that? I believe there's a real something will happen when you start praying. So that's the most important thing you can do. And then, don't nag them. Love them. When they're grown up, it's too late to keep on... Uh, nagging them and love them and pray for them and pray that they'll come to a place of need and show them affection and show them Christ. Show them the change that Jesus Christ has brought in your life. And once in a while, put in a word for the Lord. You know, a word in season. Uh, uh, you know, a right word at the right time. God will give you wisdom for that. Okay, another question. Jesus told us we will not know the exact day of his return, but Peter states this day should not overtake us like those who are asleep. By the signs of the times, where do you think we are in God's last day schedule? You know, Jesus said two things, don't forget. He said we do not know the exact day or the hour, but he also said in Matthew 24, you will know, Matthew 24, 33, that he is near, right at the door. So there are two things. One, you don't know, verse 36, Matthew 24, 36, the exact day. Is it on September the 27th, 2017? I don't know. That's the day at 3.30 in the afternoon. Mountain time. I don't know. Exact day and hour, nobody knows. But, verse 34, 
verse 33, you'll know when he is near. When you see certain things happening, you know that he is near. And wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes have always been there in 2000 years. They seem to have increased nowadays. Deception is one of the great marks of his coming. There's plenty of deception around today. False signs and wonders. There's never been a time in Christendom when there's been as much counterfeit miracles, counterfeit deception in these big television programs and up on the platform and all that and so many counterfeits, uh, people being pushed down and people being told that's the Holy Spirit, that's not the Holy Spirit. Jesus always lifted people up. He never pushed people down, not even once. So it's amazing how Christians are deceived with all this. This tremendous amount of deception going on nowadays. And uh, to become more specific, two, I'd say two things. Instead of, these are all general statements. Two specific things. Luke 21 verse 24. Jerusalem, the last part, 21-24, Luke 21-24, will be ruled, trampled underfoot means ruled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are over. When Jesus was walking in Jerusalem, when he spoke those words, Jerusalem was being trampled by the Romans. That means ruled by the Romans. After that, many other people, the Muslims, ruled it for many years. Then from 1917 onwards, the British ruled it for many years. And then in 1948, Israel became a nation. But finally in 1967, uh, June 1967, Israel got Jerusalem, finally. The whole of Jerusalem. The first time in 2000 years that Israel got the city of Jerusalem. First time. Never happened before. It was written here many years before. So I know that we are pretty close. And Zechariah chapter 14 it says in relation to Jerusalem. In the last days, verse 2, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle and then the Lord will go forth verse 4 and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives so he's talking about his second coming just before his second coming before he comes back to the Mount of Olives where he went up from Jerusalem is going to be a big scene of battle there's going to be a lot of talk about battle around Jerusalem and we see Jerusalem in the papers almost every day now do you know that 50 years ago nobody talked about Jerusalem or 70 years, years ago for 2,000 years, nobody bothered about Jerusalem. But in the last few years, there's always talk about Jerusalem in the papers. The Palestinians want it. The uh, Jews want it. And it's constant conflict. There's a lot of conflict around Jerusalem. And the other place mentioned in the Bible is Iraq. In the last days, there will be a lot of conflict around Iraq. Or Iraq, as you say it here. Uh, Revelation and chapter 9. Uh, speaking about the last days, you know, the seventh trumpet is the last trumpet when Christ comes. And the sixth trumpet is mentioned in verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded in verse 14. The sixth angel had the trumpet said, Release the four angels, means demons, who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, if you look at a map, the great river Euphrates is the river that runs right through the middle of Iraq. And the four demons were prepared for the hour and the day and were released. They might kill a third of mankind. And the number of armies of the horsemen were 200 million. It speaks of a huge number of armies around Iraq. In number chapter 16, it's repeated again in verse 12. The sixth angel poured out river upon the great river Euphrates and it was dried up to be prepared for the kings from the East again for battle. So, there are two places mentioned in scripture in relation to the last days where there's going to be a lot of conflict before the coming of Christ. One is Jerusalem and the other is Iraq. You know, we hardly ever heard about Iraq ten years ago. You know that? Today it's in the papers every single day and it's war, 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 war. Fighting, killing, suicide bombs, all types of things around the great river Euphrates. I'm excited. My Savior is coming back. Amen. My head's lifted up. Jesus said, straighten up and look up in these days and 
This is not the time to play the fool. This is the time to make our lives count for eternity. I'm excited. So those are the few things I would mention. Deception and these two specific things. Okay, this question is not very clear. How do I climb out of this box in my mind? The box is not mentioned. You know, but there's an expression in English called thinking outside the box. I don't know what is meant here. That in, in a slave too, when I try to focus on God, my mind is still a slave in that box in my mind. Maybe it's a particular, I don't know what the person means, but it's probably a particular thought pattern. Which he calls a box. Where I'm always, my mind is always going into that thought pattern even when I try to focus on God. It may be slavery to sexual thoughts, maybe to pornography, it may be something else, it could be anything. Mind is always going to that. Sex is a very, very strong force in the human race. God's made it like that, particularly in men. And if you don't really battle it, it will rule you and destroy you. You got the, God, can, God alone can give you the power to battle it. And He will give you the power because anything that's impure, God will always give us power to overcome it. But you have to stay, you have to cooperate with God. The Bible says run away from immorality. I mean, you can't keep cigarettes in your table drawer and say, Lord, please help me to give up smoking. You got to throw that away. You can't walk into pornographic stores or places where there are books which are not clean and say, Lord, deliver me. You got to run away from situations that tempt you. Alcoholism. You got to run away from friends who drink. Avoid them. When they start drinking, say, excuse me, I got to go to bed. I got to get up early in the morning or something. Make some excuse and get away. And uh, seek fellowship with other God-fearing believers. That's That's... We must show, the, if we show the Lord, Lord, I desperately want to give this up. I want you to help me. And I want you to change my thought pattern. I believe the Holy Spirit can do anything. We've all become from childhood to a greater or lesser degree, slaves to certain thought patterns. It could be the love of money. That could be a tremendous box in which we are stuck. Always my mind is there. That's another type of slavery. It doesn't look as ugly as pornography. But it's just as bad in drawing people away from God. And I've got to say, Lord, I want to think like Jesus thought. I want to have the values of heaven. And for that we must read the scriptures more, seek fellowship with godly people. And nowadays we also have the tremendous opportunity of listening to CDs and messages on the internet and so many provisions God's made in these days of tremendous pressure to keep our mind focused on the heavenly things. And ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. And put into your mind, determine that you're not going to put any of that bad stuff anymore into your mind. Keep putting into your mind the Word of God. Meditate on God's Word. Memorize Scripture. And gradually, I've sometimes used this illustration. If it helps you, use it. Our mind is like a bowl of water. It was absolutely clean when we were born. A baby's mind. But we put all types of muck into it. It's absolutely filthy now. How can I get this mind clean? I'll tell you. Take God's word. I can't reach out and throw it all out. There's no way of doing that. But I can pour God's word into my mind. And my mind's got a limited capacity. My mind's capacity is not infinite like the universe. It's got a limited capacity like a bowl. There's a capacity to it. And it's full of dirty water. What happens when I pour clean water into that into that bowl. Gradually it becomes less and less dilute, less and less dilute. It overflows, overflows and over a period of time, maybe a few months, it becomes a little cleaner. It's not perfectly clean, but because I'm pouring in God's word, God's word, God's word, it becomes cleaner and cleaner and those dirty dreams that come up at night don't come so frequently because I'm pouring in God's word. And you keep doing it, after a while some of those things will I mean, they're hardly ever there. You may see a speck of dirt here and there in that bowl. That's the way to do it. Keep pouring in God's word, but don't every now and then add a spoonful of dirt inside. Just be careful about that, and then you'll be all right. Okay. I want to understand 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. Why is it disgraceful for 
a woman to speak in church. Um, I prefer the New American Standard translation, which says it is improper for a woman to speak in church. I don't want to use the word disgraceful. It's improper means um, you've got to see it in its context. Remember that Corinthians is a letter. It's one letter. And look at each chapter as a page. This is page 14. If you turn to page 11, which is chapter 11, he says there a woman can prophesy in the church with her head covered. So obviously he cannot contradict on page 14 what he's written on page 11. So there he says a woman can pray. She can prophesy in the church with her head covered. And then he says here a woman shouldn't speak. So we must understand in its context. So when we compare scripture with scripture, which is a great way of understanding scripture, we read in 1 Timothy 2, a woman should not teach. Teaching is an authoritative job and God has given the position of leadership in the church and in the home to the man. That's a gift of God. It doesn't make the man superior to the woman. It's a position that God has given, a gift of leadership. So a woman should not be an elder or a pastor or a shepherd or a leader or teach because teaching is authoritative. You know, standing up and saying, this is the way the church is going. This is what we believe in this church. That's not the calling of a woman. But she can prophesy. She can share something, even in a meeting. I mean, our Wednesday meetings, our Sunday meetings are usually teaching meetings in our church. But our Wednesday meetings are more like 1 Corinthians 14. It says sharing meetings where we'll have 20 Young brothers and sisters getting up and sharing. Brothers and sisters. Equal number. Get up and share something from God's word for two or three minutes. It's not a testimony. They're sharing something they got from God's word. And it's edifying. I'm encouraged by what I hear. Sometimes, you know, they are immature and it's not very edifying what they say. But sometimes some of them, what they say is very good. and They grow. So we encourage them to share God's word. But we don't allow a woman to take authority. It says in 1 Timothy 2, A woman should not exercise authority over a man. She should be quiet in that realm. It's explained here, quietness is in the realm of teaching. But she can bear, verse 15, she can bear children, which a man cannot do. So there you women are superior. In case you thought, thought you were inferior. You know... <laughs> No matter how hard a man tries, he can't bear children. <laughs> it's all put in the same context, by the way. Women, you're calling, you can't teach. Men, you can't bear children. Let the women bear children and let the men teach. It's an equality. God decided who should do what. Okay. Another question is, I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. I don't believe the way they do. But I'd like to know the significance of the 144,000 mentioned in the book of Revelation. It's a thing I've struggled with since I've learned the truth. Well, <clears throat> you know, the book of Revelation is full of symbols. Right from the very beginning where it says, The Lord signified it. Chapter 1 verse 1. Signified means He used signs to teach spiritual truths. The book of Revelation is full of signs. For example, a sword comes out of Jesus' mouth and He's got legs of bronze and white hair. That's not physical description of Jesus. It's a spiritual description of the word of God coming out of his mouth, etc. So the whole book is full of signs. Everything is symbolic. Don't take it literally. When it says 144,000, it's symbolic. It's not a literal figure. It's a symbolic figure, meaning a number that can be counted. 144,000 can be counted compared to what is mentioned in chapter 7 and... Um, Verse 9, a great multitude that could not be counted. It's a contrast. Chapter 14, verse 1, a small number that can be counted. Compared with chapter 7, verse 9, a large multitude of born-again people who could not be counted. From every nation. That includes all the aborted babies. All the, where there's a high rate of infant mortality, like in Asia and Africa. I mean, millions of African and Asian babies in heaven. Because the infant mortality rate there is so high. And uh, from every tribe and tongue and nation, there will be people in that huge multitude of millions and millions of people. A lot of them will be aborted babies. 
were saved and in heaven through the blood of the Lamb. They all went there by the blood of Christ. Just like we're saved by the blood of Christ. We're justified by the blood of Christ. God justifies those babies. They're all there. There's a great crowd. But there's something those babies missed. They could not follow Jesus on this earth. And there are something many Christians miss. Who are only thinking of going to heaven. You know there are many Christians who say, I just want to get to heaven. There are other Christians who say, I don't want to just get to heaven. I want to follow Jesus on earth and show my gratitude to him for what he's done for me. And those are the ones mentioned in chapter 14. A much smaller number. It says, these are not just people. In the chapter 7 it speaks, they only say our robes are cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Great. But chapter 14, the testimony of these people is different. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And no lie was found in their mouth. They cleansed themselves from the habit of telling lies. And they were righteous. They kept themselves pure from the women means Babylon and its harlots. Kept themselves pure from the harlotry of Babylon and her daughters. And they followed the Lamb wherever he went. That's a very small number. So it's just speaking about the overcomers who uh, will be there standing with the Lord on Mount Zion. Okay, now that just two more questions and I'll finish. These are not really that important. Were Adam and Eve created to live forever? And it says in Genesis 3.22 that, you know, lest they, the Lord said, lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever. Uh, why did he warn them not to eat of the other tree of knowledge of good and evil, lest they should die? See, essentially, we don't need to answer that fully, but I would say this. Have you seen, have you, supposing you, for example, you and your hus- husband, husband and wife, you're going out of the house and you tell your five-year-old, listen, you can do anything here, but please don't open that jar which I've kept on the table. When you come back home, what do you think they would have done? That one thing you told them not to do is the very thing they would have done. This is Adam. Adam's race is like that. So God tested Adam saying, listen, there are 10,000 trees there. Go and eat of any of them, but one tree, don't touch it. Sure enough, he goes and takes from that tree. It was a test of obedience. Will you obey such an easy obedience? Will you obey or not? They disobey. If without obedience, they could not be holy. No one can be holy if he doesn't choose to be holy. So that's very important. So that's why God told them, not to do one thing. He just wanted to test their obedience. Okay. The last question is, Paul told Timothy, if you point these things out to the brothers, you'll be a good minister of Christ. He also said to Timothy, to command and teach these things. And in First Timothy, some of the th- teachings were, prayer made for all, women's modesty and submission, qualifications for overseers and deacons, church discipline, Communion, family relations. I hear Christians say that Paul spoke from his Jewish background, his culture, and our time is different. Well, you know, if you read 1 Corinthians, and the first thing you see is, there is about women's dress. I think you've got a mindset which has been influenced by your tradition. Do you know the most important thing in Timothy? Let me read you a verse, which is completely missed out in this question. 1 Timothy 4.12 Let no one look down on your youth, but be an example in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, in your purity. Show yourself an example of those who believe. One of the most important verses in Timothy. Do you know that godliness is the most important thing Paul urged Timothy for? The other things are there, but they are not primary. And if you concentrate on the little things in the Christian life, you'll miss out on the main things. Those are important. I mean, if you've got a little injury on your finger here, and you've got a heart attack, which are you going to deal with first? Tell me. I'm not saying you should ignore the injury on the finger, but if you've got a heart attack, brother, it's much better to deal with that first. There are serious problems in Christianity today. Serious problems of ungodliness. And it's not these little things that are primary. You deal with the serious things first. So I believe that those are the things that we need to. And unfortunately, Christians have a tremendous habit of majoring on minor points. And they keep on majoring on minor points and they never build the church of Jesus Christ. 
And if they do build, they build a church which is majoring on those minor points. Now, Jesus came to the world not to make women cover their heads.